On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we begin in Costa Rica, in an amazing rainforest. Here, they make delicious chocolate out of cocoa beans. Mother Nature is at her magnificent best, showcasing hundreds of plant and animal species. To wrap up, we'll take all precaution necessary to look at one of today's most active volcanoes. Green monkeys will be our tour guides in the Kenyan lost city of Getty. Later, we will stop to wonder at the poetic symbiosis of wildlife in such close proximity to the capital, Nairobi. Despite its 200-year existence, some members of the animal kingdom remain oblivious to Nairobi's existence. A green belt of land lays between Nicaragua and Panama. It is Costa Rica, a tropical paradise where life remains inherently connected to the sea, rainforests, and history. In 1503, Christopher Columbus landed near Ilsa Uvita. The Spaniards followed soon afterwards, annexing the territory to their colonial empire. After being on the losing side of the Spanish-Mexican War in 1821, the Spanish could not stop the Costa Ricans from declaring independence. Inspired by nature's bounty, they named their land the rich coast, Costa Rica. Democracy took root in the mid 20th century and Costa Rica has been one of the most peaceful Central American countries ever since. One of the first wild beasts that may be encountered here could very well be this mantled howler. It feeds on young leaves and can weigh up to 10 kilos. It is no loner. Groups of around 10 are often seen feasting together on the ever-present vegetarian delicacies. The Costa Rican coastline is constantly under siege. Waves of the Caribbean batter the coast from the east as if trying to break through the sliver of mainland and join the waters of the Pacific on the other side. It isn't the only never-ending battle taking place here. The nature of the mainland appears to besiege the sea in return. Its only ammunition is the opulent jungle lining the Caribbean coast. It appears that the only thing standing in the way of the jungle is a colonnade of palm trees. This silent battle has few spectators. It may be the regular soothing rhythm of waves washing the coast that results in a very relaxed way of life here. It's also the most likely reason why surfers from around the world flock to San Jose in search of the Pura Vida, or pure life, a life without rushing, intricacies, or confusion. It is very advisable to wear neoprene shoes, boots, or wellingtons when entering the Costa Rican jungle. It is wet here. We're talking misty rainforests. The cloud of vapor emitted by the rainforest each day ensures the prevailing humidity. This is no place for a rheumatic to be. The Costa Ricans truly love nature. They established 20 national parks and eight reservations here, covering an incredible 27% of the country's area. Bird watchers can admire over 850 types of birds, one of which is this boat-billed heron. It lives in the mangroves lining riverbanks and survives on crustaceans and fish. It can exceed half a meter in height, and it is apparent why it was given the name boat-billed, thanks to its unique bill. It is one of the most distinctive birds of the Costa Rican jungle. In this labyrinth of trees, bushes, and other sorts of plants, the entangled boughs form a safety net above the water. Curtains of greenery surround the canals and generate a humid duskiness. There is a slight resemblance to Venice, the only difference being that our unstable Costa Rican gondola 
floats among stout, lush tree palaces belonging to birds and reptiles. It's a good thing that no time is wasted nowadays by swapping film rolls and digital cameras. Looking around, it would be a great shame to miss anything. This turtle, for instance, or that plumed basilisk over there. It runs so fast that it can actually skim the water's surface, appearing to walk on water. This is why the locals call it the Basilisk of Jesus Christ. There are tens of thousands of plants here, including 1,200 species of orchid. One can only envy the sloth. He's got his whole life to take in the beauty of the jungle. We, unfortunately, have to move on. Cocoa trees grow all around a small house, otherwise enveloped by the jungle. Mrs. Ileana collects the cocoa beans, which she later barters for other foodstuffs at the market. What she doesn't barter, she uses to make chocolate. Don't be fooled by the name. The inside of the cocoa bean is not nearly as sweet as you might otherwise expect. The cocoa bean has a long journey ahead of it before it lands on our tables in the form of a luxurious treat. First, the beans are sliced open and placed in a chest where they are left to ferment for four days. Each fruit has about 50 beans. Having fermented for four days, each of these beans must then be left in the sun to dry before being roasted over the fire. The brown color signifies that the beans are now ready for the next phase, battering the beans so that the remaining pulp separates from them. The pulp would ruin the taste of the chocolate. Mrs. Ileana's grandma sieves it to get rid of all the impurities. When that's done, she handpicks the best beans. The result is a brownish powder which, to some extent, resembles chocolate. However, there is still something missing. It's now time for the final step in the production of pure, ecological bio-chocolate. The powder is mixed with water and cane sugar. This recipe is ancient. It goes back to the time of Montezuma, the Aztec ruler, who considered cocoa drink a delicacy. The Aztecs were more than aware of the aphrodisiac nature of chocolate. The word chocolate comes from the Aztecs. At last, the chocolate is wrapped in banana leaves. First, it is necessary to heat the leaves to make them flexible and prevent them from breaking when folded. The grandma painstakingly molds the chocolate Our treats are ready. Those may come in handy as we are now headed toward the distant waterfalls and a murky, forbidding volcano. Let us bid farewell to cocoa beans and the lovely handmade chocolate. The Costa Rican landscape is a gold mine in the eyes of developers. So much room and unused space. The Costa Ricans are duly proud. The Costa Rican government attempted to implement asphalt road building on a number of occasions to no avail. Despite the obvious fact that roads would have facilitated transportation and improved life in general, the locals refused. They are content with what they have and feel no need to deface their country with industrial and tourist infrastructure. And so it well may be that in a couple of decades, we will visit Costa Rica as one of the few remaining paradises left on Earth. If the Costa Ricans had a different mindset, Salto San Luis, located in the Monte Verde province, would have been condemned to empty beer cans and other trash, rather than the magnificence of the surrounding rainforest, streams, and even this two-story waterfall. The threat of unchecked tourism continues to loom over the natural wealth of Costa Rica. This is why the Costa Rican government devised a system of hanging bridges over the misty rainforests in the national parks. Visitors may thus admire the beauty of the rainforest without trampling plant life or stressing the animals. And of course, you can't pull up plants as a souvenir if you can't reach them. This experience could be rather unpleasant for those afraid of heights or suffering from vertigo. Count yourself lucky 
if you are not one of them. You can take advantage of the intricate system that allows you to be hauled even higher, where you can admire the rooftop of the rainforest. It can be a breathtaking, awe-inspiring, adrenaline-pumping experience, and more than well worth it. Each tree is a world of its own, a real green microcosm in a great green macrocosmos. A few hundred years ago, the Spaniards were disappointed not to have discovered any gold in Costa Rica. At that time, they failed to notice the treasure all around them. Let us look around one last time. Dark, forbidding, and veiled in clouds, this is the Arenal Volcano. It is one of Costa Rica's symbols, and it is also one of the world's 10 most active volcanoes. The height is quoted as around because it erupts so often that resulting lava flow causes it to grow by approximately four meters per year. Its first eruption was about 7,000 years ago. During its most recent and mild eruption 12 years ago, 40 square kilometers of rainforest paid the price for its foul mood. Lately, Areno has been relatively quiet and well-behaved. Just one tiny earthquake per week. Perhaps it too has succumbed to the ever-present sense of pura vida all around. And now, we are off to Africa. Welcome to the Kenyan coast, bathed by the Indian Ocean. The sun is slowly rising above the Kenyan Swahili coast. The name alone signifies that we are about to meet a coastal culture. The word Swahili comes from the Arabic word Sahil, meaning coast, and the plural is Sawahel. It is a seafaring culture inherently linked to trade in the Indian Ocean. This coastline began to lure Arabic and Persian merchants as early as the first millennium AD. The area was rich in ivory, but the slave trade was by far the most lucrative at the time. Today, the coast is a source of revenue for fishermen and from tourists. Mombasa, a city of almost one million inhabitants. It has a distinguished past. First records of its existence come from 16th century Portuguese seafarers. The traffic anarchy can seem bewildering to the unsuspecting tourists. The locals, however, have it down to a science. The portrait of President Obama, whose grandparents came from Kenya, is to be seen on many matatu, the local version of a minibus taxi. Amid the busy street life, city parks are a welcome oasis of peace and quiet sought out by the locals, just to relax or enjoy a small picnic. In between the thick trunks of the baobab trees, they find ample shade. But attention must be paid to the large pods growing on the trees and falling at times. The pods do not fall of their own accord. It wouldn't be Africa if it were not for a few enterprising individuals operating in the crowns of the trees. And so, the trees offer relaxing, shady niches to some and a livelihood to others. The baobab tree is very popular among the people. The leaves are considered great eating when included in salads. The seeds are used as a thickening agent in cooking, and people use the ground bark as a cure for fever. Collection of this fruit may seem a risky business, but the wide boughs are sidewalks to the feet of an experienced collector. The baobab fruit is commonly used in Swahili cuisine. It offers more vitamin C than oranges and provides more calcium than cow's milk. It is often referred to as the fruit of the future one of the most sought after commodities in this part of Africa is candy made from baobab fruit. The pulp, called mabuyu, is cleaned of the fibers. The fibers are utilized in the making of purees and as an additive to milk. No kitchen utensils required here. The pulp 
pulp is carefully selected. This is followed by the preparation of a red dye with a dash of chili. When it's ready, the pulp is colored in the dye and sweetened. And there it is, a candy treat. The baobab is, indeed, a tree worth singing praise to, not just due to its sheer size, but because of how practical it is. Not all cities survived the pitfalls of centuries past. For unknown reasons, Life suddenly vanished from the city of Getty at the end of the 17th century. The city is veiled in mystery. Though no official records exist, the expanse of observable ruins gives silent testimony to the wealth and glory of Getty. In the first half of the 20th century, archaeologists unearthed the remains of a port and a tomb dating back to the end of the 14th century. Neither gave away any secrets. It is almost as if Getty was cursed, or that something wanted to deny it ever existed at all. It is a place perfectly suited for an H.P. Lovecraft story. The city was devoured by the jungle, and its ruins are now occupied by a troop of green monkeys. Their monkey ancestors may have lived here a few hundred years ago, but they also didn't keep any written records. The sheer size of Getty, as well as its mystery, is breathtaking. Baobab trees are to be found here, too. And the green monkeys aren't about to miss out on the tree's delicious fruit. Green monkeys live in great troops, and the hierarchy within the troops is infallible. According to many scientists, these monkeys are able to articulate threats they sense from other animals. They use a specific screech, for instance, when a leopard lurks nearby. They will use a screech with different characteristics when they spot a snake or see an eagle. At a very young age, monkeys learn the sounds from their elders. Similar to naughty adolescents, they derive great pleasure and entertainment from freaking out the adults using these warning sounds just for the heck of it. The mother monkeys have no tolerance for such silly pranks and are determined to teach their young good manners. The youngsters are in for a good walloping, that is, if the mothers manage to catch them. Because monkeys have a natural tendency to be aggressive, the monkeys hang around the visitors, having learned that food is to be found in all sorts of dodgy places. Monkeys are not the only animals thriving in the surrounding forest. This is the single largest stretch of solid coastal jungle in East Africa. Eucalyptus dominates here, and the illegal exploitation of timber has taken its toll. For the time being, the jungle is holding its own. It is large and vast. As a result, animals are able to continue to find refuge there. An abundance of endangered bird and butterfly species gather here, as does a herd of elephants. Unfortunately, the growth is too thick and impenetrable for us to see them. A man without a donkey is a donkey. This is one of many Swahili proverbs. It applies especially on the island of Lamu. Its capital, Lamu, dates back to the beginning of the 16th century. The unimaginable wealth of its inhabitants no doubt came from the trade in ivory and slaves. The city has managed to maintain its character and remains a unique example of Swahili architecture. It has been included by UNESCO as a cultural heritage site. Clearly, no other means of transport but a donkey would do in its narrow, winding streets. Two tractors appeared on the island recently, and the police force can also brag of its own vehicle. 
This is no match for the donkeys, though. There are 3,000 donkeys on the island, so they ensure that they are the majority of the interstate transportation. The goods are offloaded in the port. From there, they reach their designated destination atop one of these stubborn creatures. The baskets used as saddlebags are made of palm leaves. The leaves are first dried, then the women weave them into narrow strips, which are eventually sewn together. The same technique has been used forever. Mattresses and other merchandise made of palm leaves were exported from Lamu. Their import is mentioned everywhere, including on the island of Zanzibar. Kenya's capital, Nairobi, is nicknamed Nairobi because of its staggering criminality. Even though these animals are living in what amounts to the city suburbs, these zebras and wildebeests haven't got a clue. They live peacefully within sight of the city, but at the same time sufficiently far away from it. They are yet another living example of how transient the boundary between wilderness and civilization is in Africa. So why don't the animals fear civilization? Once uncontrolled hunting was abolished, the animals returned to the city periphery, barely seven kilometers from the city center. The Nairobi National Park was established, a wild game reserve accessible even to those who have very little time to spend with the animals. It is more of an open-air zoo. Here, zebras are rather common. They are in great abundance because they migrate across the savanna from July to August. You won't sight any of the African Big Five here, namely leopard, lion, elephant, rhinoceros, or buffalo. Along with zebra, the more common animals include wildebeest, giraffe, and ostriches. Don't expect the ostrich to hide its head in the sand, though. They are so accustomed to seeing throngs of tourists and schoolchildren, they remain absolutely unfazed by humans. You may encounter wildebeest grazing freely on the plains. Springboks and antelope of all shapes and sizes are also commonplace. Herons prudently thrown at water holes. Water holes are essential for the survival of all in the savanna, and generic animosities are forgotten here. Giraffes float by majestically, looking down upon the world. They deserve their God syndrome, being the living proof of Darwin's evolutionary theories. They stretched so far and so long to reach the highest and furthest growth that they survived. Evil gossip has it that Darwin only reached this conclusion having heard from the natives, and taken for his own, the legends on how the giraffe originated. But that is an entirely different chapter. For the moment, we are still in the Nairobi National Park, and we can take pleasure from nature untroubled by human intrusion. The sun begins to set over Africa, and with it, ends our ventures into the stunning Kenyan and Costa Rican jungles. But for how long will we have the ability to enjoy these jungles? For only as long as we are willing to accept the responsibility of being good stewards to the land, and our environment. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now.